I thought this was a much better title. Thank you for the seated introduction. It's very nice. <laughs> um, no, but th thanks. Of course, it's always fun to be here. And so this is a trick because I say galaxy clusters and the fundamental physics of inflation, but I'm going to start in the reverse order. So if you want to go to sleep for the first part, it's okay. But um, so, so also I realize this, this is a mixed audience, and so please just ask me whatever aspect you're most interested in if I don't spend enough time on your favorite part of the topic. Um, my basic plan is this. Essentially, to first tell you why, and maybe you already know, but in some detail, hopefully, why theorists think non-Gaussian entity is so incredibly exciting um, in terms of trying to understand and uncover what the, the really fundamental high energy physics of inflation actually might be, uh, which is basically trying to write down some theory for either the fluctuations of the inflaton as a quantum fluctuation or, or in the variable that's more physical, the curvature. So this initial, how do we generate these initial curvature fluctuations? And then I want to tell you, you know, as you go through those calculations, you learn to look for some particular types of physics and ways that you might look for those things in observation. So I want to tell you in particular how uh, large-scale structure clusters or, or dark matter halos um, provide ways that you can pick out some of that physics, possibly, in this nice picture there. So also, I don't have credit for my pictures, which I realize is illegal based on that form that I just signed. Um, so most of the pictures that are nice and clearly are mine are from either the SDSS website or the WMAP website. All right, so why, why do we love non-Gaussianity? So basically, non-Gaussianity for inflation is like detection of the Higgs for uh, understanding you know, standard model and, and physics beyond the standard model, or direct detection of dark matter. Basically, we have these concepts, right, inflation, dark matter, um, and we don't yet know what the precise particle physics representation of that concept is. So non-Gaussianity, because it's, 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 it's very much it's looking at interactions, just like you use these interactions to probe exactly what the Higgs is, it's looking at the precise interactions of this thing that right now we just call the inflaton, and by looking at those interactions, we hope to, to sort out the precise physics behind this, this conceptual idea. So that's the basic idea of why we're so excited. And so basically, you know, the, the background story is that if you want to explain inflation in the sense of how does it solve, you know, the, the flatness problem, the horizon problem, you know that essentially all you need from GR is some kind of matter with equation of state roughly minus one. And often we say, okay, let's just call that a scalar field, right? So a scalar field, as long as it's dominated by its potential energy, has essentially that equation of state. And that's all you need to do to get the conceptual uh, part of inflation right and sort of these big, large-scale problems. So I want to just show you the picture because there are a couple aspects of this that will be important for me as I go along, remind you what the picture is. And essentially for the background, you can imagine there's just some classical motion along some potential, right? And that drives this accelerated expansion, and that's what gives us these nice solutions to sort of the global issues um, that we want. And for the most of the history of inflation, people spent a long time trying to uncover or to, to write down possibilities for exactly what that precise potential could be, right? So it becomes a bit of a crazy game of writing down higher and higher terms and you know, more and more derivatives and how, how closely can you, you know, figure out the spectral index, things like that, to determine the shape of this potential. Um, and of course, when we're doing that, we're really looking at fluctuations along this, um, and we're treating the inflaton sort of as a clock, so that, you know, the progress of time during inflation is as the field rolls down this potential toward the end, so later times over here, different positions along the potential uh, correspond to essentially smaller scales. And of course, the CME is only sensitive to a certain part of that region. So this is part of the reason why large-scale structure is interesting, because it allows us, of course, with a lot of other physics in between, but it allows us to try to probe a little bit further along uh, this history of the potential. OK, so in terms of the background solution, the only parameters that you really need to know, you know, there's people introduce these slow roll parameters, epsilon and eta, and everything is pretty much you know, classified in terms of those. The part that's really interesting, the fun part, of course, then, is the fluctuations on top of those, right? The quantum fluctuations of this field, because that's where most of the information actually is. Up until now, it's just an idea of some source of matter with a particular equation of state. And the, the great part about the fluctuations, of course, is that we have lots and lots of places to go look for them, right? Certainly in the CMB, and then essentially everything that happens after that. OK, so what are, what are we doing sort of technically, right? Well, we say, OK, we need some theory for the scalar field, and the simple theories have gravity, they have some kinetic term, standard kinetic term, and some potential. And this is where, you know, most of the energy until recently has gone, is in this potential. And what we do is we essentially just divide the field up into the classical part and the fluctuations and plug this back in and write down the action at each order for those fluctuations. Look at the statistics of that. So I'm going to change, so, so you all know that the picture is that we think we have this scalar field on the potential, but I'm going to change now to something, you know, to the more physical variable in a way, which is the curvature. So remember, this is just how it appears in the spatial part of the metric. Um, and just imagine Taylor expanding the action. So each, the, the index here just indicates the order of powers of zeta that appear in the action. 
So zero powers is that background expansion. It's essentially just the potential. Two powers is the quadratic part. And that's mostly what people are familiar with, right? When you go through the derivation of the uh, statistics of, of the inflaton, of the power spectrum, you take the quadratic part of the action. Uh, you, this is where you get your, your mode equation for the modes uh, of the field. And what comes out is just the power spectrum, right? The two-point function. So it's very simple. It has a delta function here in momentum. So it doesn't depend on anything except the particular value of the momentum. And it has a leftover piece that we know dimensionally has this k to the minus 3. And then it has what we usually call the power spectrum. And from the, the fundamental model of physics, right, what, what enters there is just the, H, the, the Hubble scale, the scale of inflation in Planck units, this additional parameter epsilon. And we parameterize that as a form that has a simple uh, constant piece, an amplitude of fluctuations, and some residual scale dependence. So remember that this, the scale dependence uh, that's coming in actually contains significant information, right? Because it, it's one of, the, one of the ways that we think this idea of having a, a scalar field rolling down a potential is actually right, right? The fact that the, the spectral index is slightly less than one seems to, to, to coincide with our idea that, you know, as we go down the potential, uh, energy and fluctuations slightly decreases. Uh, and so it's quite important, actually, that this thing appears to be a little bit red. I'm going to use this form uh, to parameterize scale dependence of higher order correlations as well, with the same idea that what we're seeing in the, in the spectral index here is just some indication of how things change during inflation. Right, some relevance of which, which fields are important or which energies are important. So I'm going to keep this form uh, and use it. And the meaning of this index will always be the same. And remember that, in general, you know, we can derive this from theory. And usually people write it in terms of those slow roll parameters that we're used to. Uh, and we also have numbers for these things, right? Two numbers, thanks to WMAP. We know essentially the, the amplitude of fluctuations. And we know the spectral index. And again, it's important that it seems to be less than 1. And that's fantastic, right? It's a huge, huge accomplishment that we now have, have gone from like the Kobe picture to the WMAP picture. But of course, these are two numbers. So as you know, the story for the last many years of inflation is that you can write down all kinds of models, can change the model somewhat radically, and you can always fit these two numbers. So there's not, much, there's not a whole lot of physics in that, right? So the point is, we want to do better. We want to go beyond the power spectrum. So basically, anything beyond the power spectrum is non-Gaussianity. Uh, if the distribution is non-Gaussian, it just means that any higher order connected correlation function is different from zero, right? In terms of what I wrote down before, essentially, we just want to go to higher orders in this expansion of the action in powers of the fluctuation. So S3 is just going to be the thing that's cubic in zeta or in delta phi. And what's great about this is that these terms are interaction terms, right? So now we're going beyond this sort of free field picture. And we know they have to be there. So Absolutely, this thing is interacting gravitationally, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be telling this whole story. So that has to be true. Um, in addition, there are likely to be self-interactions. I mean, certainly when people start writing terms in the potential, they're writing self-interaction terms. Uh, and you can get more crazy than that, as we'll see. And there could be other fields present, right? It doesn't have to be a single field slow roll model. So the point is that as we start looking at the specific structure of these terms, we're really asking about the specific form of these interactions. Is it gravity that matters? Is it a self-interaction that matters? Is it an interaction with other fields that matter? And so that's why non-Gaussianity, in some sense, contains a lot of information that's, that's more than just the, the power spectrum. So probably you, if you just look at that S3 term, right, people focus on that a lot because that's the first term that you expect to be non-zero if, if you have non-Gaussianity. And the form of it is, again, uh, quite simple, right? So in momentum space, I lost my, there it is. Uh, maybe not. It's, not. it's faint. So essentially, again, the idea is just that you, again, have a delta function of momentum, right? So again, you have this sort of homogeneity and isotropy. doesn't matter how you arrange your points, where they sit on the sky. So you have a delta function of momentum. And the thing that's left over, which is B for bispectrum, by because only two of these momenta actually matter. And you can go back to your generic slow roll picture, right, which is what models that people used for years and years and years, and you can write down the answer for the bispectrum, the three-point function. And you find a, a couple of interesting things. First, you find that generically, it goes like two copies of the, the amplitude of the power spectrum squared, and then there's some number here, and that number is of order epsilon. And this structure that's left over, you compute exactly by knowing what that third order term in the action actually is. So these are just, as it turns out, the most important terms for calculating that guy. And it's gravitational. And this amplitude is what is usually reported 
now as sort of this number FNL, right? When people put constraints on non-Gaussianity, it's FNL. And roughly for the slow roll model, FNL is something like of order epsilon slow roll. So how non-Gaussian is that? So basically, here's, here's where we sit, right? FNL of about 0.05. Essentially, NS minus 1 is the amplitude of, of FNL for slow roll. Just from nonlinear effects and gravitational effects, we already expect something much, much bigger, right? And I think as of yesterday, this number is actually now 5 instead of 3 or something. It goes up and down a little bit, but it's, it's a order of few anyway. So already, it's a hard task to detect stuff that's not even primordial. And that's probably going to happen maybe with Planck, something like that. So the, the next number, as you might guess, is the potential for Planck, roughly. So if this number is a little bit bigger and we get really lucky here and do really well, what we're actually probing, if we see something, is not the primordial physics, but the gravitational physics, which is already interesting. But there's all kinds of room in between that and, and what we actually constrain, right? So at the moment, current constraints from WMAP and large-scale structure, depending exactly on the model, sit somewhere like order 100. So again, orders of magnitude higher. <laughs> How big could it be? Well, the definition of very non-Gaussian in this context is essentially a number of about 10 to the 9 halves. So that's the origin of the statement that when people say, you know, fluctuations are Gaussian to a very good degree, they're talking about the difference between this number and this number, which is already remarkable. But the difference between even this number and what we expect is huge. So there's all kinds of room in there for very interesting physics, for lots of discovery. And yeah. Evolution, you mean yeah, so sub, not, not primordial in the sense of what's generated during inflation, but, yeah. But, you know, on the large scale, it would be, so, so large, so, if I, do, if I look on, on the same case, uh, will there be some like, the evolution bring you from uh, 0.05 to 3? Uh, I, guess, I guess maybe on the very, very largest scales, it might be a little bit lower. So maybe you want to exclude, like, the highest L? A few, maybe, but but yeah, for the most part, as long as there's some some subsequent evolution there, it should generate that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so so the most the most exciting thing as a theorist is first of all there's there can be all kinds of physics in there that we haven't come close to constraining, and if we see something with Planck, you know either we're testing this really well or it's just not slow roll inflation, which would be great because then something interesting. Okay. So let, let me just remind you of the origin of a couple of those points. Um, you've probably seen this before, but the, the, the fact that we label deviations from Gaussianity as FNL has to do more with what people were thinking about uh, some, you know, quite a while back rather than what we think of when we construct inflation models. And that's, that's called this local onsatz. Uh, and it's very nice for a lot of reasons, but basically it's just the simplest way to take something that's Gaussian in real space. You say, okay, well, I know my field is nearly Gaussian, so let me keep the Gaussian part. And we create a deviation from that by just squaring the field, and then this f nonlinear is the, is the coefficient of that term there. So that's the original origin of that term. And it's also sort of the origin of my, my statement that FNL less than 10 to the 9 halves is, is what it means for FNL to be big or to be nearly a Gaussian, right? Which you see just by looking at, for example, the two point of this guy, you have the Gaussian piece, and the first term comes from this thing squared. So the number can be quite large, and it's still Gaussian. And it's also, in this convention, the origin of a very important qualitative feature, which is that if FNL is greater than zero, that corresponds to more large-scale structure. FNL less than zero is less large-scale structure. So that's a, a qualitative aspect that, that's, ex of course, extremely useful observationally. Uh, and so for the local model, if you just fill in the details, uh, you can be more explicit now. And you, again, you, you find the same type of scaling with two copies of the, the power spectrum amplitude. It's proportional to this number FNL, and you find a very simple uh, form for that leftover uh, K dependence, which is the sum of the Ks cubed over the product of the Ks cubed. Very simple. And it turns out that this, to some extent, actually resembles what you get if you have multiple fields active during inflation or after inflation. So if you have something that, that at the end of inflation is actually partly responsible for generating the, the curvature fluctuation that we see, you can get something that looks roughly like this. It's also somewhat close to what you get in slow roll, but the amplitude is very small. So if you see something that looks sort of like this, but with an FNL that's larger, then it's a good indication probably that there was somehow more than one field uh, important during inflation. So that's already a very significant statement, right? Because Planck sees something, it's local, you know, there's two fields, or there's, there's not one. So qualitative stuff gives you uh, general physics information. <coughs> 
to compare different models, of course, people have to find a way of, of generalizing what this FNL is, okay? Because this, you know, this definition clearly only works for this particular model. In general, you know, what comes here can be completely different. So usually, one, one way to compare them, it's not the only way or necessarily the best way, but often when you hear bounds, what people have done is they've taken some completely different model here, they've evaluated it at the equilateral limit, scaled out by the stuff that seems, by the sort of amplitude that you know, makes FNL big or small, which is this amplitude squared, and that's what they quote as an FNL effective. So that's a rough way to compare models. Okay. And so all the information, or a lot of the information then at this level uh, is actually in what kind of triangle the signal is localized for. So you probably also heard this discussion uh, lately, but uh, essentially if you have any single field model um, with with non-derivative interactions, uh, you get a signal that's large in the squeeze limit. So basically, because if you just have one field, that field is a, is a clock, and it's telling you how the potential changes during inflation. And this is coupling very long wavelength modes with short wavelength modes. The only scale of that coupling that there can be is, is the spectral index, right? Because the only change that you can have between fluctuations on a large scale and a small scale has to be proportional to the change in the potential. So it's quite generic that for single field, simple models, uh, in, in this limit, you, you get something proportional to slow roll, so it's always small. So it's definitely, it's, it's more general than what I said. It, it's, it's extremely general that seeing something large in the squeeze limit is two fields. If you, if, of course, there are other options than this, and one that's important, for example, are equilateral triangles, uh, and those end up being generated by derivative self-interactions that are active during inflation. Okay, but that, that was just the bispectrum, right? So that, that whole discussion and the whole discussion about constraining non-Gaussianity lately that's been so exciting has just focused on that next order after the Gaussian thing, which is great because already, as you can see, there's tons of information there. But the point is that, of course, that's, that's not the end of the story, and this, this is extremely relevant also when we start talking about observation and simulation. Uh, but from a theorist's point of view, higher orders means more work, right? So taking that gravitational uh, inflationary action, even if you just remember calculating the power spectrum, you start calculating higher orders in that thing, it becomes kind of a nightmare, especially if you have a complicated theory. So to go, to push past this is really a lot of work. And so it's very important that we understand when we look at constraints, you know, how much do I trust my answer based on the fact that I only computed up to third order and I don't want to go any further or I didn't go any further. Because at each order, we expect new things to pop up, right? In terms of, of this, there are certainly new interaction terms that might be relevant. Uh, if I just imagine generalizing the, the local onsatz, you know, there can be a cubic term here with a new parameter. So whatever you do, and in fact, in multi-field models, this is extremely natural. Each of these terms is some sort of a, is coming from a Taylor expansion of some interaction. So of course, there's another term here at this order. So it's important when you, whatever onsatz you take and when you look at your observations to, to be aware of you know, just how much you trust from the theoretical point of view what you put in to your model. Okay. Furthermore, we, we have from, you know, from the fact that we think this is a sensible fundamental physics model, we have an, an idea of how this series has to behave. So we certainly think that it should be a perturbative series, right? So to some sense, in some sense, being nearly Gaussian means being perturbative because interactions are small and you can add them step by step. So you can ask for some sort of generic constraints uh, that come out if you, if you ask that this series uh, expansion in the action be sensible. And if you do this for, for slow roll, you get very sensible results. So for example, if you take the constraint that the energy in fluctuations should be less than the energy of the background, which seems very sensible, you get the constraint that H over M Planck must be less than one. So that's, that, that's sort of what we expect. You know, as we're building this theory, we don't expect it to be valid if H is bigger than M Planck. And that comes right out from, from asking about this constraint. At the next level, you want to ask that the interactions, when you compute the fluctuations, are small compared to your computation of the power spectrum. So essentially, once you've done the computation of the power spectrum, you want that result to be valid you know, for all time. You don't want to have to go back and, and recalculate it. And asking that the interactions are small, here I've, I've used S3, but you, of course, have to ask that for any interaction, uh, is, is asking that, that you believe the power spectrum. So you can, do all, you can learn all kinds of fun tricks as, as you do this. So one thing that you can do if you look at a completely generic single field model, you can say that the correlation functions have a particular structure that helps you understand how this series is maintained, how this expansion is maintained. Uh, and it's, it's something that's familiar uh, from gravitational perturbations in some sense and it's called this hierarchical structure. So for a completely general single field model of inflation, you can find that the endpoint function 
goes like the power spectrum to the n minus 2, right? That's good. This is a small number, so it tells us that each of the correlation functions are going to be suppressed by small, you know, higher powers of that small number. Uh, but there is one other small parameter that can creep in the denominator, which is, which is the sound speed. And I'll remind you what that means, but essentially it just rescales the horizon of fluctuations. And that, that's generically less than 1, and that can come in the denominator with additional, pow you know, with additional powers at each order. So that already makes you, you makes you wonder what's going on with this series. But the interesting thing is, when you look at the dimensionless combination of moments, and this will, again, pop up maybe in a more familiar sense later, so you take the endpoint function uh, and rescale it so that it's dimensionless, you find that the thing that controls this series is always a combination of the amplitude of fluctuations and this thing called the sound speed. So essentially, as long as the CS to the 4, if I just square both sides, is greater than P zeta, the amplitude of fluctuations, which you know, then this whole series is sensible, you know, assuming all coefficients are sensible, things like that. People would say that's a bound on, on CS greater than 1, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I that. So, um, so by the, the origin of this argument, and tell me if this is answering your question, but the origin of this argument is essentially looking at where you need to include higher derivative terms. So, but that's assuming that you're in an inflationary, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're in an inflating background. So you could go and you could construct your theory, you know, and, gener and try to ask where you, where you trust it for non, where you trust the fluctuations for a non-inflating background. But that's probably, you know, then H isn't going to be in there. The scales are going to be different, right? So this, this is really for trusting the perturbative expansion in an inflating background. But if I didn't care about inflation, if I just took some then, then you'd have the very, like, very standard power counting of, of terms, right? So you have some scale that come in for the derivative interactions, and you want to keep energies and scattering lower than that. It's a, it's a standard argument then. Yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you meant? Or? Yeah, so in fact, one of the things that's very interesting, and maybe Louis will talk about this a little bit tomorrow, is how that counting changes when you're in an inflating background. Because then suddenly you have the scale H that enters, and it sort of changes where strong coupling occurs and the way a temperature does and things like that. So it changes, it changes the counting in an interesting way, actually. So f for these models, CS to the 4, as it turns out, so this, this CS, as I'll, as I'll remind you, is, is in some sense a, measuring a strength of interaction. So basically it goes like F and L to the minus 2. So for any model of inflation, you actually end up with something that you expect, which is exactly like the bound that we had from that local ansatz for any single field thing. And it just tells you that, you know, F and L, as you're measuring it, can't be too large, right? Interactions can't be too strong, or you don't trust your calculation of the power spectrum. So it's, it's a simple concept, but, it, but you can show quite generally that that relationship needs to hold. So the, the sound speed, I, I maybe should have introduced this first, but remember, it's just a, a rescaling. It's a sound speed for the fluctuations, so it tells you where they freeze out. CS less than 1 typically tells you that that horizon has shrunk. And the origin of this is, is for a single field, actually just coming from derivative interactions. Um, so you can write a very generic action where instead of a, a standard kinetic term and potential, you have a generic function of first derivatives here in this case, you know, and just the field itself, which would be standard potential terms. And the sound speed tells you how important those corrections are from a standard kinetic term. So these are derivatives of that function P with respect to this combination X, which is just like phi dot squared. So the more different you are from standard kinetic term, the smaller CS is, and the more, you know, the, the stronger those interactions are. And people study this in a variety of contexts, but it turns out to come out very naturally from some particular string theory models, so people got even more excited about it, you know, taking it seriously. Um, so basically, the point is that for, from a theoretical point of view, even before we talk about observations, you know, really considering what these interactions do to your theory of inflation is really interesting because, you, you know, you, you have all kinds of techniques now, essentially from, from particle physics, to, to say if you understand your theory or not, which is a lot of fun. Um, and one of those, uh, basically, let me, I'll just show you one small application that's kind of cool. Um, so I told you that there's this gradient energy bound for slow roll. And for slow roll, the interaction bound is actually essentially less constraining. Uh, if I translate this bound into the language of the amplitude of fluctuations, p zeta, I find that that amplitude uh, for this bound can be less than 1 over epsilon squared. In general, from here, it's less than 1 over epsilon. But epsilon is a number smaller than 1. So this p zeta can be bigger than 1. Okay, so what? Uh, that's essentially what it means to have eternal inflation. So you might think p zeta greater than 1 is a bit weird, right? Curvature fluctuations are, are big. You know, do I really understand what's going on there? 
if you go and talk to you know, Linde or the old school guys, they say, yeah, yeah, it's no problem. You're just looking at it wrong, slicing, things like that. But this argument shows you exactly sort of why it's true, why it works. So to keep your, your interactions perturbative, you need p zeta less than 1 over epsilon. The condition for stochastic eternal inflation is that quantum fluctuations of the field are greater than classical fluctuations, essentially. So the, the field can stay up high in its potential. Inflation can continue forever instead of the field rolling down and inflation ending. And if you translate what that means, so you look at the amplitude of fluctuations delta phi compared to the classical motion of the field, this is exactly that combination p zeta. So to have stochastic eternal inflation in slow roll, you need p zeta greater than 1. That's perfectly within sort of a perturbative regime of calculation. So it's something, there's a reason that we can talk about eternal inflation within the, the theory of inflation and have it make some sort of sense, basically. That's not true once you go to this sound speed model, which is, which is interesting. So essentially, as soon as you have these interactions, these derivative interactions, and those are the dominant interactions, you have this new scale of the sound speed creeping in. And this was shown uh, by Louis and myself and in a different context by Chung et al. And you can, again, just evaluate you know, what the, the rough amplitude of that thing is. And you find now that the condition is p zeta is less than cs to the 4. And cs to the 4 in sensible models is always less than 1. So basically, you don't have perturbative eternal inflation in this kind of theory, which is kind of exciting because eternal inflation is kind of a pain in some ways. So if you can get rid of it, that's kind of cool. So, so, so observationally, we know a value for that number, right? But if I'm looking at a, at a model where I'm interested not just in our local patch, but in the global picture of inflation, then I might ask, is there a regime in this theory where I can go into the eternal inflating regime where p zeta can be of order 1? So that's clearly not the part that we observe, but that could be a regime in the theory. Does that make sense? Yeah, or, So I see this is one, and this is much smaller. Yes. Yeah. And you say in that, in that inequality, which is what we want for the for the derivative, we don't have to turn the that's what you say. Yeah, yeah. So you turn the inflation, we'd need this to be one, and that's never true. Or that's always less than CS to the four. Or CS to the four is more. So, so, so um, the definition of eternal inflation is P zeta of order one. Yes. So uh, in order for CS to the four, to be greater than that, it should be one. Sorry, I think I'm missing you, misunderstanding your question. Okay. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. If you just go back and compare amplitude of classical quantum fluctuations and amplitude of quantum fluctuations, and you ask that the quantum dominates, that's the same as having this p zeta of order one. Yeah, so essentially for any sensible theory from a field theory point of view, I mean, that's a whole different discussion, but CS should be less than 1. And so you don't have it. Yeah. And you, you also, in principle, think that you're learning things about physics, right? The whole, the whole reason we like high energy physics and inflation together, one reason is we think the scale of inflation is high. So this sort of belongs to the regime of high energy physics, and we should try to figure out what's going on. But, but even more than that, if, if you have these derivative interactions, let's say, or if you have multiple fields or a variety of other physics, you really have some scale of new physics that's entering into this discussion. So when I have these higher derivatives, again, this, you can think of this as phi dot to the 4, uh, dimensionally I need some scale, some mass scale here, uh, that tells me what's going on at that scale. Typically, we think that all scales in the problem during inflation that aren't h are m Planck. And if that's true, then there's nothing interesting here because m Planck is always large. This is the kinetic energy. We know that has to be small compared to the potential energy, which already has to be less than m Planck. So typically, this isn't interesting. It's only interesting if this scale m is much less than m Planck. So there's some physics in between the Hubble scale and the Planck scale, which is completely legitimate, completely possible, right? We don't think h is necessarily the end-all story of what happens at high energies. Then these terms can be important. And this, in fact, is exactly what happened in the string theory model. There was a, a string scale entering here, you know, new physics below m Planck, uh, that made these terms interesting. So if you think that you have the potential to see you know, interactions of this type, you may have some clue into other physics that's active at you know, Hubble and super Hubble scales, which is very interesting. And this, this, this is just an example that I'll, let me just mention because I, I worked on it a lot. But it's a, it's a model of inflation and string theory. Why would you ever want to do that? Well, the reason you want to do it is because 
this setup gives you a set of consistent rules to deal with the problem. And it gives you a set of you know, how you merge and plank with your geometry and things like that. So, so you might think that that's bizarre, because if we don't have rules, we can just make up whatever we want, and it's, it's all better. But it turns out that when you have these scenarios, you actually come up with some interesting phenomena. And that's, that's essentially what happened here. Um, it's, it's nice just because, in principle, everything is calculable. And you can go and look for generic lessons that you might hope hold, regardless of what the very high energy physics are. And your general lessons you know, turn out, well, it's hard to get inflation. Uh, this model has large non-Gaussianity of an equilateral type. And it's scale dependent. So it has all these kinds of features that you say, oh, yeah, maybe I should go look for that in the data, essentially. So. OK, so let me, let me summarize uh, roughly the qualitative features that we're interested in. And then I'll move on a little bit to talk about the observational part and how each of these things applies. So, so remember, the first thing is just, you know, is it very non-Gaussian or not? Is it slow roll or not, essentially? Um, if you look just at the particular form of the bispectrum, you can ask which triangles have the most amplitude of signal in them. You can ask about the sign of that FNL number, which is the sign of the skewness. So if it's positively skewed, you get more large scale structure. Just like the spectral index for the power spectrum tells you something interesting about how things are changing during inflation, you know, the field is rolling down the hill, essentially. You can ask the same thing for all the other higher order correlation functions. Is there any scale dependence? And if there is, what does that mean for my, you know, how things progress during inflation? Um, and then you can ask, you know, does everything make sense in sort of how I think the structure of these correlation functions uh, go? And each of these features can rule out, you know, some vast class of, of models. They can rule out all of slow roll, for example, right? So we're really in a different era of inflation physics now. Okay. So first, let me talk a little bit uh, about clusters and non-Gaussianity. So basically, what I, what I showed you primarily is one particular type of statistic, right? So I showed you several examples of the bispectrum. And this is a whole class of statistics you can take and calculate you know, each endpoint function as you go along. Of course, non-Gaussianity, you, know, you can also make, take any combination of higher order correlation functions. And that's still some sort of valid statistic. Um, and for example, for large scale structure, cluster number counts turn out to be that kind of statistic. So, you know, for some particular cases, especially when you know exactly what model you're trying to check, so you've calculated the particular shape of the bispectrum, you know, you, you give yourself a template and you run it through the CMB data or through the, the large scale structure data, that's very powerful because you can take a particular model, you can look for exactly that, and you can see if it's there or not. If, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, or if the measurement that you're looking at isn't particularly sensitive to a particular shape of a, of a bispectrum here, you might want to try something else, right? Something else that somehow takes a conglomeration of, of higher order correlation functions. That's essentially what, what clusters do, and other things like you know, uh, morphology uh, measurements in the CMB that have this name of Minkowski functionals. And if you do that and you want to compare what all these different measures do, right, you need some sort of translation so you know how to go between some sort of statistic like this and the amplitude of the bispectrum that you might be constraining in a different way. So you need to know, how, again, this is, this is sort of that structure of correlation functions. You need to know how to make a series expansion, if you like, in, in, in uh, terms. OK, so let me say a little bit more about this. So basically, what is it doing? Well, if you imagine drawing, so, so this is a black is a Gaussian curve. The red and the green are non-Gaussian. And what they are is an exact change of variable from that local onsatz. So these are exact representations of the local onsatz with that one variable, FNL. And the, the red is uh, negatively skewed, so the positive tail is suppressed. The green is positively skewed, so this tail is raised. Uh, and so the green would be positive FNL, and it would have more clusters. And clusters, you know, you're just looking for some you know, big statistical fluctuation, right? So they're sensitive to this end of the, you know, to this positive uh, end of the tail. So you get more of them if you have more room under there. But that's not just one, one number, right? It's not just the skewness that's going in there. Uh, in the local model, you have a way of, it really contains all the moments, essentially. And it's some sum of those moments that's contributing to this tail. OK, so the other thing that's interesting about cluster counts and there, is just the scale that's probed. So this was the original reason that we got interested in this, um, in this paper. And, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, as, as you know, I think that, um, so I think possibly cosmic strings might be one example where that's true, where the four point is higher. And also, I, I think to some extent, these uh, inhomogeneous reheating or these, uh, these uh, resonance models might also have that. I mean, it's only in, 
so it seems extremely natural, right, that you have this, this hierarchical structure of moments. And anything that's sort of perturbative single field, that's going to be true. Now, if you have some two field interaction and you have some weird, you know, you can always cook up some sort of fine tuned model where it's not true. But I think in addition, other types of physics, possibly like cosmic strings and things like that, have a different structure to their moments. So. Right, no, 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 but I, I think what I thought what he was asking was, I showed you the structure of how moments scaled compared to the two point. And like you're saying, they're always small. I mean, at least in sort of sensible perturbative single field. But I think that's, if other physics is generating the curvature fluctuation, such as wiggles of, you know, cosmic strings, I think that relationship is, like that local type relationship isn't necessarily true. That's true, but yeah? for strings, the F and L is all the tend to be nice, tend to be part four or whatever. So mm -hmm. the F and L are already huge. Yeah, yeah, okay, in, in addition, in addition. Yeah. But I think his question is, if you are, imagine F and L really is small, uh -huh. can you still have the G and L dominate? Yeah, so, so I think, I think that, that in itself could, so you can imagine that I could do something weird, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying that this is a working example in all ways, but you could certainly imagine that you have only a very large uh, quadratic interaction or something like that. So you, your, your three-point interaction is coming from gravity or you know, something small, but some other physics kicks in and for some reason generates only a four-point for you. I, th I think that's plausible, but that means that the physics that's, that's creating that is not just, you know, maybe there's two different physics or it's not single field slow roll. And I, I don't know that anybody has, I thought cosmic strings, there was an argument that, that the kurtosis should be larger than the skewness, but maybe that. Yeah, but they put all the unity, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah, so, so this, this, of course, could be a distribution of anything, but in this context, I want... Yeah, it is also, so that certainly makes, so, so here I've, I've totally put things not to scale because I've, I've set sigma equal to one, so you can see, and I put a, a very large FNL, yeah, but just for visualization. Okay, so, so, so one other reason that clusters are interesting is because the scale that they probe is the scale of the object, essentially, and even though they're very large objects, that scale is, is much smaller than what's probed by the current CMB. So this green region was, was the ruled out region of WMAP5, and it essentially hasn't changed. And this is the point. So, so WMAP can't test for scale dependence at the moment. So if you take the most conservative limit and put their bound on FNL at the smallest scale that they measure, then these lines are essentially showing you for different amounts of running uh, how large the non gas candy could be at different scales. And you have lots of other probes, of course, in here too. And with Planck, the CMB line is going to move over quite a bit. So eventually, these, these regions start to overlap more. But it's interesting that there's still some, some range where um, you know, you're not only testing different physics that's relevant, of course, for the CMB versus for forming large scale structure, but you're also sensitive to different scales. So you're sort of pushing down that potential. Yeah, and if, and if you, again, just, just uh, pretend that your scale dependence phenomenologically goes like this, then these are lines with this parameter, oops, I didn't show it, equal to uh, 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 0.02 and 0.06, I think, here. Okay, so, so what I was telling you before directly feeds in actually to how you actually make predictions for, let's say, something like, like cluster number counts. So uh, if we want to predict what we think we see for those, uh, we want some number density of objects you know, as a function of mass and redshift. Um, and there's a part of that that we certainly know how to do, we know how to take the primordial part and turn it into the matter distribution. The parts that are tricky are, first of all, providing that initial probability distribution for those fluctuations, and then figuring out how it actually collapses into objects, which is your job, you and the audience. Um, so, so this is essentially what, what we can provide from fundamental theory, right? As hard as I want to work, I can provide you with a better and better probability distribution by expanding my horrible inflation model out to higher and higher orders. Um, and so let me, just for simplicity, let me take a, a press sector style approach where I'm just going to take that distribution and integrate it above some threshold, okay? So I want to be able to plug in something here to integrate. Uh, and then from that, you know, you can do it, you can generate the mass function. So let me just remind you what's going on here. I can formally write, you know, any uh, statistic as an integration with the distribution that I give you. 
there's the mean, the variance, sort of the usual things that we're used to. Uh, and then what I need actually are these uh, cumulants. So these are the rescaled uh, versions of the endpoint functions, or here I call them the p-point functions, okay? So the first ones are the skewness and the kurtosis. And for a Gaussian, all these things are zero. So that's very simple. For the local model, in addition, everything is very simple. Basically, for the local model, everything just goes like powers of FNL at first order. So the first one is 6 FNL, next one goes like FNL squared, FNL cubed with some numerical coefficient I wasn't sure I had right because it's all kinds of combinatorics, but you know, you get the idea. And then there are corrections. So there are all kinds of things that are nice here, especially if you want to simulate it because basically, you know, you put in this simple real space idea and you get out something that has very good statistics and has every endpoint function you could want. Um, but remember that, that that onsatz we think is probably only the first term in a series, right? If I think this is coming from a multi-field model of inflation, for example, I think there are more terms there. So that S4 should have not only this FNL squared term, but some other coefficient that's roughly of the same order coming from this expansion. So the reason this matters is that if you take the distribution, so you can formally write the probability distribution, you know, as an expansion in these moments, and it looks something like this, called the Edgeworth expansion. And what you see is that at each order, I have this combination S3 sigma appearing, and here I have S3 sigma squared appearing together with S4 sigma, and so on and so on and so on, okay? So basically what I showed you for the single field model was I showed you this uh, a dimensionless combination of moments, which is exactly the same as these combinations that are appearing here. So that dimensionless combination of moments being perturbative in the, in the single field case guarantees that I'm allowed to do this and I'm allowed to truncate it, essentially, you know, up to understanding what the coefficients are. Um, so it guarantees that I can expand about a Gaussian. But I have to remember, it, it also allows me a very particular way of calculating what the error is due to the fact that I didn't want to calculate S4, for example. So generically, I expect this term to contribute roughly the same order as this term. If I've, you know, taken my inflationary theory to third order and perturbation theory, I can calculate what this is, and I can tell you how much it corrects the answer. So I can also tell you roughly how much you're missing because, well, I'm missing because I didn't want to go to all the work of calculating the next order term. So it's a very nice prescription for telling you how, how far you trust your, uh, your theoretical, your analytic calculation. So that's what, what we can do is use that to estimate the error that we're making. Okay. So now, of course, there are all kinds of other issues here. <laughs> um, you know, this essentially... You know, you know the whole story of Fresh Schechter, and now we're just repeating that uh, mistake, if you like, by, by integrating this non-Gaussian distribution. For the plots that I'm going to show you, we, we tried to compensate for that by just using this prescription to take a ratio of the non-Gaussian to the Gaussian thing and multiplying it by your favorite, most trustworthy mass function from simulation. So even so, of course, is this, a, is this justified? Even if you think it's justified for the local one, you know, for some ones that's enough for other, you have no idea, you know, exactly where it works. So essentially there's all kinds of work to do here. And I think I want to show you just a couple of things that can happen uh, with this. I think I have time. Um, when you try to compare to simulation. So the first thing is that all the issues with the Gaussian case recur, right? So just to remind you what that is. So this is a plot from people that were doing non-Gaussian simulations. The points are their simulations. But this in particular is a Gaussian case. And the blue line is press checker. So it's too big here and too small here. And all those issues are going to recur. The other thing that happens, which I told you about, is that the simulation with the local onsatz contains all the moments, right? So when I take my mass function and I compare an analytic thing that's truncated to what you get from the simulation, you expect it to be wrong, right? You expect it to be wrong because I only calculated out to a certain order. Um, and furthermore, you don't expect, even though that's what your simulation did, which is great, any real life thing is also going to have errors of order the next order term. So you, you again don't trust it in the sense that it's fantastic that you could simulate all the moments from that one expression, but you expect there to be corrections at the next order. So people now have started to simulate things with a cubic piece and all of that. So that, that's very relevant for comparing to things that you think are actually coming from fundamental theory. Okay, so to show you what that means for, for comparing actual mass functions, so these are plots where I'm comparing Oh, it's too small, probably. These are different mass regimes, so the mass increases from here to here to here to here. I've just blown up portions of the graph. Um, and so we have, uh, oops, I forgot to put the lines here where these go. But basically, we've got 10 to the 12 solar masses over here, 10 to the 14 solar masses over here. So the black lines are Gaussian. Um, the blue line is an analytic mass function from simulation done by Pilipich et al. for FNL of minus 90. The green line is a first-order analytic mass function, which I showed you the expansion for a few pages back. 
And the red line is if you try to take into account some of those Gaussian, those already issues that are already there at the Gaussian level, and you put in a ellipsoidal collapse threshold. You lower the collapse threshold, basically. So I'm not sure how well you can see. You can look at these after. But basically, what you're looking for is alignment, I would, I would say, of the blue line and the red line. Um, and you can see that the ellipsoidal collapse does what you expect it to do at the very low mass end and pushes the green line down to the red line, essentially. And also that there's very good agreement with those things out here at the very high mass end. But what it actually does is it pushes the transition between where, so you remember how in the Gaussian, the non-Gaussian curve, there was a region where the curve was higher than the Gaussian, but to compensate, right, there was a region where it was lower than the Gaussian, closer to the, the small mass part. Changing the threshold changes very much where the crossing of the Gaussian and the non-Gaussian lines occurs. So in some sense, that, that, that's a little bit of a problem. The other thing you can do is just include the next order term. So now all these lines are the same, the Gaussian, the analytic mass function from simulation, the first order term, but now the red line is changed to a pink line, which is including the second order term in that series expansion. And that doesn't change where that overlap is. The fit is still bad out here, as you might expect, because it's all based on press sector, but it starts getting better at the high mass end because you're including a correction that should actually be there. And you expect the correction from S4 to be roughly the same order, so you should expect the correction to, to fit it even better. So the reason I'm showing you these plots is just that, that it's very hard to, to pick out the physics of, of how you should correct these lines, I would say. And probably, you know, so we need to do a lot more simulations and, and work a lot harder, basically. But I think we still don't have a good understanding of how to make the, the mass function fit well at all scales. Okay, well, let me show you. It, suppose, suppose that the, mass, the analytic mass function that I wrote down is sensible, which is a big supposing. Uh, let me just show you roughly the, the, the level of result that you can get. So these are results showing non-Gaussian to Gaussian uh, mass function ratio uh, as a function of mass here. Lines above one have FNL positive. Lines below one have FNL negative. Different lines of the same color have different running. So that means that the level of non-Gaussianity is actually larger at the cluster scale. That makes sense, right? If it's running, so non-Gaussianity is larger at cluster scale, there's a larger deviation. Uh, blue and green lines are slightly different shapes of triangles, so don't worry about that. But so the thing, two things I want to point out, of course, is the effect gets larger at higher mass. The effects get larger at higher redshift. But at the same time, you know, as soon as you get into the regime where the effects are really interesting, that's exactly where you don't trust your calculation anymore, which are these shaded boxes, because you, the contribution from missing out, you know, the S4 term and things like that becomes of, of order a few per several percent, five percent, I think we did here. So basically, if you're starting to ask, you know, this is a really rare object, can I explain it? You're starting to get into the regime where you don't trust your calculation from the mass function anyway. So it's a little bit tricky. But e even where you do trust it, you can get deviations, you know, 20, 25%, which seems like a lot. Until, this is, and I've shifted, and I've put it, I've integrated the whole thing and just put it as a function of redshift. So you think these deviations are huge until you start putting in the uncertainties, right? So until you start putting in the fact that in any realistic survey, you, you don't know what the mass is of, of the objects very well, and you probably haven't determined sigma eight very well. So the blue and the red lines are showing you uncertainties just from not knowing the mass and not knowing sigma eight. The only good thing about this plot is that the redshift dependence is slightly different. So you might think if you can get redshift dependence, you can do better. What's that? Yes, I, I, think, I think these are somewhat pessimistic, but, but on the other hand, um, basically the results that came out in these papers, if, if you like those results, have essentially, you know, maybe 4% on sigma 8 and, and maybe 15% on the mass. You know, their, their mass relationship for individual clusters is a, has a scatter of 10 to 15%. So, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so you know, I, it's, it's maybe somewhat, somewhat pessimistic, but not too bad. On the other hand, you know, to get, to see if this was constraining, we used, you know, very optimistic surveys, full sky, everything like that. So, um, yeah, so, so at this point, you know, we can, we can put non-Gaussianity into this. So, so basically what I want to conclude with here is that clusters are so important, particularly for dark energy research, that it makes sense to put in non-Gaussianity at the same level that you're putting in dark energy and just check for everything simultaneously, essentially. So uh, that, that's what I, I'm doing with these guys here. Okay. Um, well, let me, I guess I have time. Anyway, th this is an old paper, but the, the result that we found is that we think optimistically if FNL, this is of the equilateral type, because for, for the equilateral type, as I'll mention in a moment, this is still one of the better ways of measuring it on small scales, actually. So for, for non-Gaussianity of the equilateral type, if it's relatively large, 
or relatively scale dependent. This is that uh, NF, what I was calling NF index here. Uh, then you can actually hope to see something combined with combined measurements of CMBN clusters, maybe. So. So this is always on. So what we did is we put this at the smallest scale that the CMB currently constrains, so which again I think is conservative. But, but yeah. Okay. All right. So for some types of Nagaski entity, as I'm sure you're aware from Neil's work, there's a much better statistic that you can use. Um, so so of course what I was excited about this is because it's in some sense probing a you know total Nagaski entity. It doesn't have to be a three point you know whatever. It reaches small scales, and it's, it's good for this equilateral type. But as you saw, it's very difficult. And even under the best of circumstances, it, it's not as constraining, certainly, as Planck will be from the CMB. There is another technique uh, using the galaxy power spectrum, uh, which seems to be much more promising for that local ansatz type of non entity. So in the particular case where instead of having these equil equilateral triangles, you have a correlation between very long wave wavelength modes and short wavelength stuff. Uh, so now I'm probably telling you what you know, but basically what I'm interested in are, are objects, uh, any, anything that's biased compared to the background density fluctuation. So uh, certainly very massive objects, as, as you know from just taking the case of even Gaussian distribution and computing the correlation between stuff that sits above a certain threshold, uh, compared to the background, so this G is for galaxy, even though really by galaxy I mean a clump of dark matter, um, this B uh, is not one. And from a variety of ways you can calculate, uh, and then of course you can do better by simulation, you can calculate what, what you think it might be. So non gaussian entity of the local type in some ways uh, enhances this because it takes, you know, it, it, it creates a correlation between a very large wavelength background mode and the little fluctuations that are actually forming the object on top of it. And what that does, uh, as, as Neil and collaborators found explicitly in the simulation, is that that introduces a scale dependence in this B, which is just coming from the transfer function, the Poisson equation, things like that. So that's a very striking signature that you can go and look for. Um, and constraints based on current data have essentially been able to say that this is competitive with the CMB for this particular type of non gaussian entity. And continued simulations uh, improve that, that uh, idea. So yeah, so it's competitive to WMAP. So one, one thing that we can do is actually take advantage of this to go even a step further and say, OK, even for the local model, which we can simulate and which has this nice signature, it could be coming from something like this two-field inflation that there's, again, some sort of scale-dependent effect, which is telling us some interesting information about the relationship between energies of the two fields that are there, something like that. So it turns out to be a, a relatively easy thing to do to, actually, to take this phenomenological ansatz that I showed you for FNL in K-space and plug it into the local ansatz, and you can with two extra steps, put that in your initial conditions for a simulation, and see if it does anything interesting uh, for what comes out. So now Neil can tell me if he disagrees with my characterization. But if you, if you do this analytically, it looks really cool. Because what it looks like is that um, even from the bias alone, you can see the scale-dependent effect. Because what matters is really the FNL on the scale of the object, essentially. So what I have here is the blue line uh, has no scale dependence. The green line has a pretty significant running. And the different uh, line styles are different masses. So essentially, as you increase mass, you push back down to this initial scale independent line. So as you go to smaller and smaller scales with the object, you see non gaussian energy that's been running more. So you see a different local, locally enhanced background, essentially. And it looks like the result actually goes up. So this is, a, this is a, a, a dimensionless number that's sort of picking out just the amplitude of the effect. And then the, all that scale dependence and everything is just the same. So that's kind of interesting and maybe hopeful that that this technique is so promising that you can actually dig out even more exciting stuff with it. Um, and this is a, a table compiled by one of my collaborators, Licha Verde. And essentially, most of these lines are for that local thing. So this is a little bit misleading because it's just a particular type of non gaussianity right? And of course, we think there are all kinds of, of types out, out there potentially. But basically, what it says is that the current constraints from both large-scale structure and from the CMB are sitting at sort of more or less the same place. The potential is amazing. So basically, you know, all, all these structure surveys are, are going to be fantastic for lots of reasons because there's so much data there. But in particular, the potential for FNL, basically from here's Planck of order three, uh, and large-scale structure is roughly the same of order a few. 
So this is getting down to that, you know, testing that gravitational physics level. Um, uh, and, and certainly interesting for anything that we think is above that, so anything that's different from standard slow roll. So it's really exciting, and it really means that we have, you know, some few years to get all this stuff right in terms of the simulations and what our predictions are uh, so that we can hope to take advantage of this. So that's, that's very exciting. Okay, so, so basically my, my conclusions are <laughs> that moving beyond, moving into this new era of inflation, you know, beyond sort of this tree-level power spectrum, it's, it's, it's really a whole new thing because there are so many interesting things that you can do once you start trying to calculate beyond the power spectrum. And uh, if you want, Louis, tomorrow we'll talk about another theoretically very interesting thing that happens as you start to do these calculations. But what really matters is that you can take, you know, crazy toy models like this and you can rule them out, right? Because this had non-gaussian that was large, it was equilateral type, it was increasing on small scales. It, there, there are three or four different ways that you can say this model is absolutely wrong. So that's really, again, a new era for inflation because, you know, up to this point, it's been very hard to distinguish between models. And I like, you know, this, this panel, I didn't tell you what it was, but it, all of these points fit current CMB data. The different colors, though, are different levels of non-Gaussianity. There are different parameter, parts of parameter space of the model. And the whole model itself, you know, has this equilateral type non-Gaussianity. So the potential there is to rule out the whole model, or if you find the model you want, you suddenly have a better tool for actually finding where in the parameter space you live. So um, it's, it's very exciting for theorists and for observers at the same time. And, and so basically I think, I think there's a, it's really an exciting time for, for taking inflation seriously and for communicating about you know, what the predictions are uh, and, and trying to do as much as we can with the upcoming data. Okay, thanks. So this is really this is really interesting. So, so first of all, I think you know, there, and maybe Adrian knows more about like curvaton scenarios and stuff like that. You you can generate something that's larger than one, you know, that's still an interesting regime of five to ten. So that's already interesting. But what happened in this particular model that I'm showing you is that you're looking at a series of derivative interactions, um, and if you start naively expanding an action in terms of derivatives, you know, some derivative over a scale m, again, you think for any sensible expansion, you're going to get f and l of order one. In this particular case, in string theory, you're given, based on symmetry and action, it has a summation of higher derivative terms. So it's square root of 1 minus summation. And because you're given that summation by symmetry, f and l can be 1,000. It can be much, much higher. It can basically go all the way to that perturbative bound where you need to start adding more corrections to the action. So you have special symmetry, and you can imagine other cases where that might be true, that's protecting you and that allows you to write down something that, that's not a generic perturbation theory answer, and then you have... So, so that's really exciting because then you're really testing symmetries of the theory even, even beyond just the amplitude of FNL. So I don't think strongly running, but certainly, certainly for, I mean, I, well, strongly in the sense that I think that, that parameter, so I was showing you examples where the running was like 0.1, um, and I think the running you can get in curvaton, what did we decide it was, 0.05 or 0.1, again, something of that order. So that's, that's strongly enough to be interesting, I would say. And in the curvaton case, you know, it's just a tuning of which, uh, sort of which energy and which field is important as inflation progresses. And because inflation is so long, that's not a particularly big shift in energy scale. And I don't, it doesn't strike me as particularly fine-tuned in that case. It's just, you know, things are evolving and they might as well. And so, so that, that's the example that I know about. And I think it's not, I don't think like, like this case that you're talking about, it's really protected by some kind of symmetry argument that wants you to go to this interesting point. I don't think anybody has an example like that yet. But, but still, it's, it doesn't look unnatural. 